The gospel lesson for today is from St. Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child has, who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at his rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Here ends the lesson. Familiar lesson um, to all of us, and you remember all the years of pageants, and uh, I remember that in the one church I was part of in Chicago, uh, the pageant was a very big part of the, of the festivities and there were 20 or 25 people in the pageant every year. And one particular woman was in charge of the gifts that were used at the pageant. And uh, every year she seemed to come up with a bigger treasure chest, something more ornate. And one year she had this shiny gold uh, treasure chest um, was it real gold, of course, but it looked like it. And then she got little um, fake uh, pearls and other kinds of stones, and she glued them on the chest. This thing was magnificent. In fact, we had to turn one of the spotlights because the glare off it was blinding the choir director. Because this, she wanted these gifts to look amazing, and, and quite frankly, they did. So we think about these gifts. Christmas is a lot based on those gifts, isn't it? Gifts were brought to Jesus. We bring gifts to each other. We give gifts when we want to recognize one another. Let me ask you a question about the Bible story. What happened to the gifts? Did you ever think about that? Jesus with gold, frankincense and myrrh were very valuable things. You remember the woman who came and anointed Jesus? Uh, Jesus' feet with the oil, and the disciples were upset. That money could have been given to the poor. That oil could have been sold, and the money given to the poor. It was valuable. So these gifts that Jesus received were very valuable. So what do you think they did with them? Think Joseph bought a new donkey? Probably wore the one out that rode to Jerusalem, to uh, Bethlehem. Maybe they redecorated the nursery in Nazareth. Brought the new baby home, new nursery furniture. We would do something like that. Or maybe Mary bought a new set of dishes for family gatherings. You know, in the holidays, in the Jewish tradition, you have sp separate dishes, special dishes that are only used on the holidays. This was a poor family. So what choices would Mary and Joseph make with those gifts, those valuables? something they didn't hold to themselves. Well, I think they probably shared with their neighbors. They probably took those gifts back and in their own community of people, their friends, their loved ones, and anyone else who had special needs, because they were very faithful people, I think they knew that those gifts were not theirs alone, that they were be, to be open to the community. And in that community, 
And in that sharing, they found the meaning of their lives. What about those gifts? It's, I think it's an interesting question because the wise men were coming for more than just giving gifts. They were coming seeking answers to crucial questions in life. Like, what does life really mean? In the midst of all the confusion and the struggle and the strife and the different ideas and the warring nations and all the other stuff which we still experience, what does life really mean? In the ultimate questions, when you look around you, and I know many of us are getting older now, we realize that a lot of our friends are gone. Many of our loved ones are gone. Many of us have become the elder of the family in one way or another. So when that time comes for us to go, what does that mean? How will we greet our own death? Will anything be left behind? Will people remember us? And what difference did it make that we were here for our time? These are the ultimate questions. And what should we spend our time on that time that we have left? Well, in biblical language, this is wisdom. This is what it means to be wise. And that wisdom is something we still yearn for today. Being as clear as we can, I think, about what it means to be, have God in our lives. And what is our place in the life of God? How does God look at you and me? And in our heart of hearts, what do we firmly believe and hold fast to? And also in wisdom, I think, is the idea that what is true with God needs to be true for every human being. So whatever we want for ourselves, for our own loved ones, for our own children, for instance, which is always an issue uh, in towns and um, school systems especially, whatever we want for our own, every child should have. Every opportunity should be open to those who can seize it and go with it. The wise men, we are told, followed this special star, but that star is only a symbol of God's light in a dark world. Always the uh, portrayals of the wise men, not always, but mostly, you see them coming at night, don't you? In the backdrop, there's the stars and the big star. Because without the star, the wise men kind of could be anybody. Could be a bunch of people selling kitchen utensils, you know, heading into town. But when you see that blue, that dark blue sky in the back and the big star and the little stars, it is really a symbol that that star comes to light a dark world. And they understood darkness, they understood evil, and obviously they understood Herod's dark intentions and dark motive. Isn't it interesting that when Herod heard the baby was born, his first thing was to be afraid. This was the king. This was the king. By the way, king, there's a baby born. And we hear that in prophecy, it's supposed to be the king of the Jews. Oh, that scares me. Think about that. Look like that. Look like that little baby whose father was covering up his ears when we were singing because he didn't want us to wake him up. I understand that. Now, when he's four years old and he starts to hum that song, Redeemer, I want you to call me <laughs> and let me know. And Herod's dark motives to the wise men was no surprise. They understood what the world was like. And for you and me, understanding evil is a very important part of who we are. Not being fooled by evil, not being uh, just run over by evil, or somehow told that what is wrong isn't all that wrong. Isn't, it's really, there's a lot of right in what is wrong. To be a faithful person is to be wise enough to understand evil in the world and our participation in that evil. In this month's issue of Sojourners Magazine, 
um, which is a Christian uh, social conscious magazine. I've read to you many times illustrations. Jim Wallace, who is the editor and um, is a very devout Christian man, he wrote this about the fact that the Iraqi war is now over. The war in Iraq was fundamentally a war of choice, and it was the wrong choice. From the outset, this war was fought on false pretenses, with false information and for false purposes. And the official decisions to argue for this war and then to carry it out represented the height of political and moral irresponsibility, especially when we see the failed results and consider both the human and the financial costs. We pray for our military all the time, these faithful and wonderful people. And 4,483 of them at last count died. And 32,000 were wounded. And some of those wounds they will carry for the rest of their lives. And what is never mentioned, and it's only an estimate, something like 110,000 Iraqi people also died. There wasn't much wisdom in that war. Wisdom is not pride in power. You are not wise, I am not wise, no nation is wise because they are powerful. And the idea that being wis having great power brings wisdom is something we're looking at in North Korea right now and scares us quite a bit. Pride in power is not wisdom. What is wisdom brings light in dark times, not deeper darkness. And the truth is that God is even in the darkness. Even in the darkness, we are told, the darkness cannot stop God. Hope is alive no matter what. Love wins. This darkness hid the forces that oppressed Jesus, and yet his teaching constantly dragged the dark ones, the self-righteous ones, the relig religious false teachers, the injustice and the prejudice, the selfish deeds that people did. What Jesus taught dragged all of that into the light and people didn't like it. And dragging evil into the light in order to change it is our job now. That's been passed on to you and me. The wise men came to be with the poor baby and wisdom to go where God sends them is what they had. They wanted this answer to life's meaning so badly that they would go wherever God sent them. That made me think of our Christmas Eve supper. Some of you um, were there. Some of you may not have experienced it or know what it was about. There was a free supper offered here on Christmas Eve, and many people came. And some people obviously very much needed what we were providing. Do you realize that on Christmas Eve at that supper, we were the rich ones? There were people coming into us rich people to have a meal. They didn't know us. They weren't sure what they were going to experience. Some of them had never been in the building before. But they were coming to the rich ones who had all the food, who were preparing this and welcoming them. And we opened it up to everyone. And I was amazed at the kids because the kids had in their mind that what they needed to do was to serve the people here as best they could. Obviously, their parents had had talks with them, you know. Now, when you see someone sit down, you run right over there. You make sure they have what they need. Yes, Mama. Yes, Daddy. On Christmas Eve, you get a lot out of kids. You ever notice that? On Christmas Eve, man, you can tell a kid anything, and that kid just jumps to it. I used to love Christmas Eve for that reason. Don't you think you ought to help your Mama? Yes, Dad. Oh, I'll be there. No problem. I did a good job today, didn't I? I was a good boy, like Mrs. Levinson used to say. You ate, didn't you? So people would walk up, and some people went to the buffet table three or four times. And the kids would jump up and run behind that table and make sure they got everything they wanted. And I loved it when the kids um, said to them, do you want more? Do you want more? I gave you two pieces of pork. Do you want three or four? And whatever they asked for, they gave. 
We were all wearing the COG t-shirts, uh, the Chaffin Outreach Group t-shirts, the light blue shirts, which are available for all of you if you want one. Just ask, and there is one for you. It was also like the wise men who go to those who are the others, you know? The others came to us this time. But the wise men went to the others to what they believed was this going to be king, but now just an innocent and helpless infant. The cog group has to be the group that goes to those who need those who are innocent or not innocent, but rather helpless or in very great need for something, either food or something else. Because if we are not welcomed by those who God loves and have very little of the world's treasure, then we don't really understand what God wants us to do. The real gift is that everyone is together in community. Everyone is in the major celebrating. That's a scene we have in the Christmas story. Jesus came to love you and me, to show us love and compassion and justice. And all these things mean everything to God. That is what this story means. When we come to the communion table, it's a symbol of this story. Everybody come. Everybody eat and drink. Everybody receive God's love. And we are called to help and create such a world as that. Is it possible? Because that is true wisdom. Amen. It is our custom on Communion Sunday to stand and greet your neighbor, shake their hands, and offer them the peace of Christ. a new start.